everyone. My name is Igor Yankin. I'm a criticalist and today I'm going to talk about a practical approach to mechanical ventilation. So the main goal of this presentation is to give you some practical tools and knowledge that you can use in real practice when you're presented with a patient who requires positive pressure ventilation. So in my personal opinion, I think there are three key components of mechanical ventilation that are crucial in order to dominate this area of critical care. The first component is so-called nebology. So you must be very comfortable with the setup process and the machine you have. If you just have a general knowledge about critical care ventilators, but you don't know the ins and outs of your machine, in a critical case scenario, you won't be able to provide high quality ventilation in a timely fashion. You can compare this to CPR training. It's been shown in human medicine that you have to participate in CPR training at least every six months in order to maintain your skills. The same concept applies to mechanical ventilation or hemodialysis and other technologies that we utilize in critical care medicine. Next, you have to understand three key ventilatory strategies that exist in critical care. This lecture is dedicated to this component of mechanical ventilation. Finally, you must know ventilator waveforms and main concepts of troubleshooting that I will cover during the next lecture. So it's important to identify your sources uh, and materials that you can read consistently in order to improve your knowledge uh, in regards to mechanical ventilation. So from my personal experience, I find these three textbooks most helpful. And you can start reading on mechanical ventilation, small animal critical care medicine that has you know, several chapters on this topic. And then you can expand your knowledge by reading uh, Pill Beam's, Cairo's uh, mechanical ventilation textbook that is much more comprehensive. I also find um, the rapid interpretation of ventilator waveforms textbook very convenient and uh, it's a good source of different waveforms, especially if you have a patient, an event, and you just need to use this book as a reference to quickly look up certain waveforms wave that you don't understand. So all patients requiring PPV can be divided into three big categories, depending on the underlying physiology and the strategy that is used to ventilate these patients. Once you understand the strategies and master them, the mechanical ventilation will become enjoyable. It doesn't mean that you will be an expert in mechanical ventilation, but you will build important basic foundation that you will continue to grow throughout your career. So these three key strategies include lung injury strategy that we use to ventilate patients with constrictive or restrictive lung disease. Um, so when the disease lungs have poor compliance and are very stiff to inflate. Next strategy is airway obstruction strategy in patients with obstructive lung diseases. Usually we mean lower airway obstruction because in reality, uh, patients with upper airway obstruction do not require true positive ventilation and uh, it, the obstruction may resolve just by intubation or performing tracheostomy. The final strategy is use in patients with intracranial or diffuse low motor neuron disease in conjunction with healthy lungs. This seems to be an easy strategy. However, it is deceptive because if you use your ventilator in a wrong way, you may actually create lung disease that was not there in the first place. So it's important to uh, follow safe ventilator strategies. So before we start talking about each ventilatory strategy in depth, I want to give you a few case scenarios. So imagine you're presented with a nine-year-old spade female spaniel uh, with a history of severe degenerative mitral valve disease and this dog presented to you in severe dyspnea and has crackles. So what strategy will you use? We're going to use a lung injury strategy because this dog 
is likely having uh, congestive heart failure that results in uh, parenchymal lung disease and lung injury strategy will be appropriate. Now you have a 12-year-old 12, 12 Yorkie with a history of chronic cough and severe expiratory dyspnea. Based on your initial diagnostics, uh, it turns out that this dog has a severe bronchial collapse. So what strategy are you going to use? In this dog, we will use an obstructive strategy. Now you have a two-year-old pit bull who was bit by a coral snake and now has a PACO2 of 65. Well, this patient has healthy lungs, so we're going to use a uh, ventilator strategy for patients with CNS disease and healthy lungs. Now you have a four-year-old domestic short-haired cat that presented to you in status asthmaticus. In this cat, we will use obstructive strategy. Now you have a one-year-old chihuahua that fell out of the bed and developed traumatic brain injury and is now not breathing well. Well, in this case, we will use the strategy of uh, CNS disease with help to lungs. Finally, you have a five-year-old dachshund whose chest was chewed on by a pit bull and now has severe pulmonary contusions. So this patient will benefit from injury strategy. So first we're going to talk about the injury strategy because it, it is by far the most common strategy in critical care medicine that we utilize. So the rule of thumb is that any patient with a pulmonary parenchymal disease that needs mechanical ventilation should be ventilated using the injury strategy. Most common lung diseases in veterinary medicine associated with a necessity to ventilate include severe aspiration pneumonia, cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, ARDS, lung contusions, pulmonary hemorrhage, and submersion injuries. All these pathologies lead to decreased lung compliance. In other words, you need to apply higher airway pressure in order to inflate the lungs to the same level. Historically, mechanical ventilation of the lungs used to utilize relatively large tile volumes. The number one goal was to normalize blood gases. In other words, to have high PaO2 and uh, normal PaCO2. And it did not matter what ventilator settings needed to be used to achieve these aggressive end goals. The introduction of the baby lung concept and lung protective ventilation principles using more physiological tidal volumes and avoiding high inspiratory plateau pressures along with appropriate levels of positive end expiratory pressure PEEP have been shown to decrease pulmonary complications and improve outcomes in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome requiring ongoing ventilatory support. So prior to mid 80s uh, in the 20th century, lungs affected by ARDS were considered to have homogeneous distribution of the disease based on the anterior posterior radiography. It was thought that the entire pulmonary parenchyma is non-compliant and stiff. Surprisingly, the first reports on computer tomography, CT examination, appeared only in the middle uh, 1980s. CT dramatically changed our view of ARDS. When they began a quantitative assessment of CT images, which measured the amount of normally aerated, poorly aerated, or overinflated and non aerated tissues, they found that the amount of normally aerated tissue measured at end expiration was in the order of 200 to 50 100 grams in severe ARDS patients, which is roughly equivalent to the normally aerated tissue of a healthy kid of 5 to 6 years old. From this finding came the concept of baby lung, which is an offspring of CT examinations. This led to realization that application of normal adult tidal volume 
to the baby lung is going to result in severe over distension and eventually a lung injury. It was easily understandable that ventilating the lung of a healthy child with, for example, 1000 mils of tidal volume would destroy the lungs. The baby lung concept has naturally led to the lung protective ventilation that was based on low tidal volume to prevent over distension of the baby lungs. Low transpulmonary pressure to minimize the stress and strain on the lungs in prone positioning which is similar to ventral recumbency in our patients. CT scans of humans with ARDS help to understand that baby lung was located primarily in the non-dependent lung regions. Therefore, human doctors started to use the prone position to improve oxygenation by increasing perfusion of the anatomical baby lung, which was expected to be dependent in the prone position oxygenation did actually improve in the majority of patients. And proning has been shown to be the most effective tool in treatment of human ARDS, which decreased mortality by 17%. The three main goals of lung protective ventilation are first, to open the lung, second, to keep it open, and third, to minimize ventilator-induced lung injury, or VILI which is by far the most important goal of any ventilator strategy. We just discussed that low tidal volume ventilation will minimize the VILI. Application of PEEP will ensure that the lungs remain open and minimization of plateau pressure will decrease the stress and strain on the lung tissue. And finally, permissive hypercapnia is a trade-off where pain for low tidal volume and low plateau pressures. And thankfully, we start to realize that shooting for perfect blood gases will destroy patients' lungs very fast. In late 90s, the ARDS network, uh, ARDSnet, performed a landmark trial called the ARMA study, where they compared low tidal volumes of 6 mL per kg versus conventional tidal volumes of 12 mL per kg during ventilation of patients with ARDS and acute lung injury. At the same time, low tidal volume group was limited to receive plateau pressures less than or equal to 30 centimeters of water versus high tidal volume participants were allowed to go as high as 50 centimeters of water. These are the main survival results from that study. The trial was actually stopped after the enrollment of 861 patients because mortality was lower in the group treated with lower tidal volumes than in the group treated with traditional tidal volumes, which was 31% mortality rate versus 39.8%. This study re revolutionized the standard practice of mechanical ventilation in patients with lung injury. There were several critics of this study whose main argument was that control group received 12 mL per kg of tidal volume, which they believed was actually higher than standard of care at that time, and it should be closer to 10 mL per kg. That being said, this study remains landmark and most frequently cited manuscript related to mechanical ventilation of all times. Before we start talking about the specifics of lung injury strategy, I wanted to briefly touch on the universal approach to a patient on mechanical ventilation. So whenever I have a patient on a vent, I always think about this four-quadrant approach to mechanical ventilation. First, you look at the ventilation and oxygenation. Ventilation is assessed by arterial CO2 levels, and the way you can adjust the patient's CO2 is by changing its minute ventilation that you can change by changing respiratory rate and tidal volume uh, that control minute ventilation. Another important determinant of ventilation is physiologic death space ventilation that may also increase uh, arterial CO2 levels and cause severe hypercapnia. Uh, 
but this is this topic is beyond this uh, conversation. Oxygenation is assessed by arterial PO2 and can be adjusted by changing FiO2 and PEEP levels. Later on, we'll talk about why PEEP is one of the main strategies to adjust PO2 level. Next, we should make sure that um, we are protecting the patient's lungs from villi. And the two major components of lung protection is limiting your tidal volume and plateau pressure. Last but not least, we want to ensure that our patient is comfortable and there is no patient ventilator asynchrony going on. The presence or absence of patient ventilator asynchrony can be determined by physical examination and waveform analysis. Sedation level should be assessed as well, however, you should remember that increasing sedation level is not always the answer, and if the patient is back in the vent, there may be a serious underlying cause that has to be fixed first before you attempt to increase sedation. Another way to approach a patient on mechanical ventilation or, you know, round on a patient that is being ventilated is ask yourself three important questions. The first question you want to ask yourself is, is the mechanical ventilation effective? In order to figure this out, you can look at arterial blood gases and determine if your PaCO2 and PaO2 levels are adequate or at least what you're shooting for. Next question you're going to ask yourself is, are your mechanical ventilator settings safe for this patient? Are you following lung protective strategy? And the final question is, is your patient ready to be weaned off? These questions are very similar to the four quadrant approach um, and can be used instead. So now we're going back uh, talking about injury strategy. And first we're gonna start talking about the mode of ventilation. So what mode of ventilation is the best for patients with injured lungs. So this is a comprehensive list of five basic ventilator modes on the left side, which include volume assist control, pressure assist control, volume SMV, pressure SMV, and pressure support. And on the right side of the slide, you can appreciate newer modes of ventilation, such as airway pressure release ventilation and pressure regulated volume control of PRVC. We're not going to cover these newer modes today, but, um, but they definitely can be utilized in patients uh, that need injury strategy. The most important takeaway message from this slide is that you can actually use any of these modes besides the pressure support that we usually use during spontaneous breathing trials to successfully ventilate a patient with a uh, lung injury or with lung parenchymal disease. So there is no evidence that one mode is better than another. And just based on statistics, the majority of human intensivists will use um, the volume assist control. Some of them will use pressure assist control. Uh, and um, more and more people start start utilizing the newer modes, such as airway pressure release ventilation, pressure regulated volume control. And among human physicians, um, nobody will actually use an SMV mode during initial therapy of a patient that needs a lung injury strategy. From my, um, you know, conversations with human physicians, uh, the major downside of SMV mode in uh, lung injury strategies that people feel uncomfortable while being ventilated in this mode because there's a combination of mandatory breaths and spontaneous breaths and it's actually much more comfortable to have just one type of breaths because a person starts to, you know, being used to one type of breaths, and now it is offered, for example, to breathe spontaneously. And now you have this combination of breaths, and you cannot get used to one type of breaths, 
which creates a patient ventilator asynchrony and that's why it's considered not the you know first choice type of mode that uh, human physicians use. Interestingly enough, SMV mode is one of the most popular modes in veterinary medicine. And the argument some clinicians make is that dogs uh, can pant during ventilation, which will result in higher minute ventilation if assist control mode is being utilized instead of SMV. However, I should remember that uh, we use pretty heavy sedation when we ventilate dogs. And in my personal experience, it's rare when they pant, especially if you use a combination of propofol, fentanyl, dexmedetomidin, CRIs. Another thing to remember is uh, if the patient is not breathing on a ventilator, SMV and assist control modes will be exactly the same because there, there are no um, spontaneous breaths. So in certain situations, you actually will not notice any difference. All right, now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of different waveforms so that you can decide what mode of ventilation is being used in this case. So the first scenario, you have your three typical um, scalars, which is pressure time, flow time, and volume time scalar. So the question is, what mode of ventilation is this? And the key uh, to the answer is first, you need to determine, is it a pressure controlled or volume controlled ventilation? And then you can decide, is it a uh, assist control or SMV mode? And we can definitely rule out APRV as the mode of ventilation in this case. So is it pressure or volume control? So the, the way to determine that is to look at the pressure time scalar. And if the pressure time scalar waveform has a square shape, that is a pressure control ventilation. So we know this is a pressure control ventilation. Now we need to decide is it SMV versus assist control. In assist control, all breaths, no matter were they triggered by time or mandatory breaths or they were triggered by a patient, they will look exactly the same. And if you look at this uh, image, you we'll see that all of them are exactly the same. The only difference is that some of them are time triggered, some of them are patient triggered. And in patient triggered breaths, you will see very mild negative deflection on the pressure time scalar. There's barely visible on this image. And um, there's, there are no spontaneous breaths in between. So that means this is a pressure control mode, which is pressure assist control. All right, so now let's decide what mode is this. So here, um, again, uh, first what I would do is I would determine is it a pressure or volume control mode. And if you look at the pressure time scalar, you do not see square shaped waveform that we saw on the previous slide. So that means it's a volume control mode. Because during a volume control mode, the machine delivers a certain flow rate during a certain period of time. So it does not control the pressure. That's why it's not square shaped. Now, once we decided that, we can determine is it assist control or SMV mode. And as you know, with assist control, all breaths should look very similar, which is not the case in here. So here you can see uh, assist control breath uh, with some negative deflection. That means the patient triggered this breath. And then you see a smaller breath. So this one is actually 
either completely spontaneous or maybe there was some pressure support applied to this breath. And again, there is assisted breath that was um, assisted by the ventilator, and then there is a spontaneous breath uh, or pressure support breath. So this combination of assisted breaths and uh, pressure supported breaths means that this is SMV mode. All right, now we're going back to the lung injury strategy, and we're going to talk about the tidal volume. So to start mechanical ventilation, you will need to choose your initial settings. And whenever you have a patient that requires an injury strategy, an appropriate choice of tidal volume is extremely important. As you remember, the majority of patients with parenchymal lung disease has, have a herogenous distribution of consolidations and the irated portion of the lungs may be significantly different from the volume of the healthy adult lungs. So we call them baby lungs. ArtsNet guidelines recommend to start with a tidal volume of 6 to 8 mLs per kg as a safe start. The main role of this relatively low tidal volume is to protect patient's baby lung from overdistension, volume trauma, and barotrauma. As we're going to discuss later, there's a huge trend in human medicine towards application of this lower tidal volume ventilation in all patients on mechanical ventilation, even those with absolutely healthy lungs, due to fears that higher tidal volumes will create and do ventilator-induced injuries. Some of you will say, hold on, why should we apply human data to our much smaller patients that belong to completely different species? Several original experimental studies performed in physiology labs in the 60s and 70s showed that lots of different mammalian species have very similar tidal volume that equals to about 6 milliliters per kilogram. If you take tidal volumes of mice, rats, rabbits, dogs, and humans from this study and divide them by their body weights, all of them will have an average tidal volume of approximately 6 milliliter per kilogram. These types of studies were the reason why the ArtsNet network um, or group of researchers chose 6 mL per kg as an intervention in the study group as compared with 12 mL per kg in a control group. Moreover, we have at least one study in veterinary medicine that proved that mechanical ventilation with a tidal volume of 6 to 8 mil per kg provides sufficient minute volumes that are enough to maintain PCO2 at normal levels of about 30 to 40 millimeters per mercury. The takeaway from this study is that we can probably adopt these tidal volumes to our veterinary species, especially to those animals with parenchymal lung disease requiring protective lung injury strategy. In this study, the authors aimed at assessing the effects of different tidal volumes with associated hypercapnia on lung injury and gas exchange in a model of acute respiratory stress syndrome in rabbits. The randomized 64 surfactant-depleted rabbits and exposed them to six hours of mechanical ventilation with the following targets. Group 1 had a tidal volume of 8 to 10 mL per kg with a PaCO2 of 40 mm per mercury. Group number 2 had a tidal volume of 4 to 5 mL per kg with a PaCO2 of 80 mm per mercury. Group 3 had a tidal volume target of 3 to 4 mL per kg with a PaCO2 of 120 mm per mercury. And finally, group 4 had a tidal volume of 2 to 3 mL per kg uh, with a PaCO2 of 160.
oxygenation and lung protection were maintained at extremely low tidal volumes in association with very severe hypercapnia. And there were no adverse hemodynamic effects or effects on intracranial pressure that were observed with the strategies. Here's another table with the results from that study. And you can appreciate the same groups uh, with different degrees of hypercapnia. Group 1, 2, 3, and 4. All rabbits in groups with low tidal volume and hypercapnia, which, is, uh, which are group 2, 3, and 4, had decreased wet dry weight ratio of the lungs, lower histological lung injury scores, and higher PaO2 as compared to the group with conventional tidal volume and normal capnia. The reduction of the tidal volume below 4 to 5 mL per kg did not enhance lung protection. They concluded that ventilation with low tidal volumes and associated hypercapnia was lung protective. A tidal volume below 4 to 5 mL per kg did not increase lung protection in this surfactant deficiency model. However, even at extremely low tidal volumes in association with severe hypercapnia, lung protection and oxygenation were maintained. Another proof that the patient size does not influence the tidal volume is that pediatric intensivists who ventilate kids with the body weights as low as 2 to 3 kilograms use the tidal volume similar to adult humans. This consensus recommendations from the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury Consensus Conference in 2015 says that we recommend using patient-specific tidal volumes according to disease severity. Tidal volumes should be 3 to 6 mL per kg predicted body weight for patients with poor respiratory system compliance and closer to the physiologic range of 5 to 8 mL per kg ideal body weight for patients with better preserved respiratory system compliance. Another very important component of the injury strategy is the plateau pressure. ArtsNet guidelines recommend to maintain it below 30 centimeters of water at all times. So how did they come up with this random number? If we go back to the same experimental study from 1960s, we can find a pressure volume curve they obtained from a man, a dog, rabbit, rat, and mouse. In all these species, the pressure close to 30 centimeters of water will inflate the lungs to almost 80 to 100 percent of vital capacity. And you definitely don't want to exceed this important physiologic parameter with your mechanically delivered breaths. So what is the plateau pressure? Let's look at this pressure time waveform first. In order to inflate the lungs or a balloon and blow air into the lung, you have to overcome airway resistance and lungs elastic recoil. The pressure on inspiration while the air is moving into the lung is called peak inspiratory pressure. The peak inspiratory pressure depends on both airway resistance and lung compliance. As the airflow ceases and you apply an inspiratory hold without any airflow, the pressure within the respiratory system equilibrates and becomes a plateau pressure because now there is no resistance that needs to be overcome. The plateau pressure depends on the lung and chest wall compliance or respiratory system compliance. If you measure a plateau pressure in your patient, and we will learn how to do that in a few slides, and this pressure is above 30 centimeters of water, in order to decrease it, you can either low 
lower your tidal volume if you're doing a volume control ventilation, which indirectly will decrease this pressure, or you can directly decrease inspiratory pressure if you're performing pressure control ventilation. So how do you measure plateau pressure? As I told you, you have to create an inspiratory pause for at least half a second in order to give time to equilibrate the pressures within the respiratory system and seize the flow. To create an inspiratory pause, all critical care vents have an inspiratory hold button that you can press and hold for half a second to a second. As soon as you finish this maneuver, the vent will freeze the waveform and will give you the plateau pressure measurement. So this is an example of inspiratory hold and, plat and plateau pressure measurement on uh, the Puritan Bannett 840 machine. The most accurate plateau pressure can be obtained when the patient receives volume control ventilation with a constant flow, however, pressure control mode can also be used. It is important that the patient is not taking any breaths and not bucking the vent during this maneuver because any airflow will skew the results. Next component of injury strategy is the ventilation that can be assessed by monitoring CO2 levels. This is an alveolar ventilation equation that relates arterial CO2 to alveolar ventilation and CO2 production. According to this equation, the arterial CO2 equals CO2 production divided by alveolar ventilation, or VA. In other words, as you increase alveolar ventilation, there will be a decrease in CO2 levels and vice versa. An increase in CO2 production will shift this curve to the right so that for the same level of alveolar ventilation, there will be higher arterial CO2 concentration. As we just discussed, alveolar ventilation and CO2 production are the two main determinants of the arterial CO2 levels. Just to remind you, alveolar ventilation equals minus ventilation, or VE, which is a total amount of air processed by the lungs per minute, minus that space ventilation, or VD. As the amount of dead space increases, the alveolar ventilation will go down. Therefore, it is important that an increase in dead space ventilation uh, would be a differential in hypercapnic patients. The key determinants of minute ventilation are frequency of breaths and tidal volume which are two important tools that we can change in a patient undergoing mechanical ventilation. It is also important to realize that frequency of breaths and inspiratory expiratory times, TI and TE, are interdependent, and as you change one of these parameters, it may impact the other two. The initial setting for frequency of breaths in small animals is usually about 20 to 30 breaths per minute, but it will vary in each individual patient and it also clinician dependent. Some people try to set up a uh, frequency closer to a respiratory rate in the patient prior to intubation. It is a rather empirical number and it will need to be adjusted based on your first arterial blood gas and comfort of your patient. You should remember that if you increase your patient's respiratory rate to a very high number, this will reduce expiratory time and may potentially lead to air trapping. Usually it's not a big issue in patients with lower respiratory compliance because it actually takes less time for the stiff lungs to exhale due to their increased elastance.
other important aspect of injury strategy is permissive hypercapnia. Whenever you have a patient with lung parenchymal disease, you, uh, your number one goal is not to normalize blood gases, but prevent further lung injury and give the lungs time to heal. To avoid ventilator-induced lung injury, you will need to sacrifice something, which is usually your CO2 level. In other words, hypercapnia is a trade-off for the lung protective ventilation. It is well known that the majority of patients will tolerate CO2 levels as high as 50, 60, 80, and even higher millimeters of mercury. As long as this change is relatively gradual and their acid-based system has enough time to adjust and prevent very severe decline in blood pH. The majority of guideline, guidelines recommend to maintain pH uh, graded or equal to 7.3. However, patients without other comorbidities such as an intracranial disease, shock, or renal disease may do just fine with pH greater than 7.15. Another important aspect of injury strategy is the oxygenation. Similar to permissive hypercapnia, this is the price we pay to maintain the lung protective ventilation. The oxygenation goal is not very high. In ARTSNET guidelines, the recommended goal is PaO2 of 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury, which co corresponds to SPO2 of 88 to 95 percent in people. This goal should be achieved by adjusting both FiO2 and PEEP in order to achieve a compounding effect and minimize the side effect of oxygen toxicity and hemodynamic compromise that can be caused by high PEEP. The principal investigators of ARMA study made up this FiO2 PEEP table. So how do you use this table? So let's say you have a patient with severe aspiration pneumonia that you put on a vent. It is common practice to start your ventilation with 100% oxygen to minimize the risks of hypoxemia in the peri-intubation period. The minimal PEEP that you should be using in a patient with lung injury is 5 centimeters of water. Next, you could slowly start decreasing your FiO2 from 100% and see what FiO2 will achieve your oxygenation goals. Let's say the minimal FiO2 that maintains PaO2 of 60 to 80 is 0.8 or 80% of oxygen. You're going to leave this value at 0.8 and will start increasing your PEEP by 2 to 3 centimeters of water every 15 to 30 minutes. First, you will increase your PEEP from 5 to 8 and see what SpO2 value you are going to achieve. If your SpO2 is above 93 to 95% with a PEEP of 8, next you can decrease your FiO2 from 0.8 to 0.7 and your goal is to choose a combination of PEEP and FiO2 that will, will be close to one of the combinations on these ARSNET tables. Remember that this table is a guideline and nobody knows for sure what combination is the best, but your end goal is to find the combination that will minimize the risks of oxygen toxicity and will also lead to you know, the most optimal PEEP that will not create hemodynamic compromise by increased intrathoracic pressure. The main reason why patients with ARDS and other severe parenchymal lung diseases are hypoxemic is physiologic shunting. Normally, the minor ventilation or amount of air that goes through the alveoli per minute should be almost equal to the amount of blood that goes through the lungs per minute. In this case, the patient has normal VQ ratio closer to 1. In patients with consolidated or atelactic lungs, the lumen of the alveolus is either filled with pus or completely collapsed so that there is no air coming through this space. As a result, 
all venous blood that perfuses this alveolus is not being oxygenated and comes back to the left atrium non-oxygenated. We call this phenomenon a physiologic shunt. So how would you treat a patient with physiologic shunt due to ARDS or CV aspiration pneumonia when they undergo mechanical ventilation? You will apply PEEP that will create collapsed alveoli, sorry, that will recruit collapsed alveoli and will keep them open. This is the reason why PEEP is one of the two tools in our arsenal that we use to improve oxygenation. So the good things that PEEP will provide are, first, it will improve VQ mismatch by decreasing physiologic shunting. It will also decrease atelectic trauma by keeping the alveoli open. It may improve spontaneous breathing by decreasing trigger asynchrony in patients with air trapping and by improving the lung compliance. The most common bad things are the decreased venous return caused by an increase in mean intrathoracic pressure that results in diminished venous return as a result. These patients may need more fluids and potential vasopressors to defend their MAP. There is no evidence that PEEP by itself causes an increased risk of pneumothorax. Definitely large volume ventilation and high plateau pressure may do it, but not due to PEEP level. Finally, patient's head will not explode due to high PEEP. However, the intracranial pressure may go up in patients whose uh, autonomic regulatory ability is lost. Inspiratory to expiratory time ratio is not as important in the injury strategy as opposed to the obstruction strategy because patients with low lung compliance do not usually have problems with air trapping or airway resistance. One to two ratio is considered physiologic. However, a reverse IE ratio has been used in ARDS patients to prolong inspiratory phase and give alveoli more time for gas exchange. Moreover, airway pressure release ventilation, one of the newer modes that is gaining its popularity, is based on very long inspiratory phase. We will talk about IU ratio more when we start discussing lower airway obstruction strategy, where a ratio of 1 to 3 and even higher can be used. All right, now we are switching gears to the obstructive strategy of mechanical ventilation. The main pathophysiologic feature of lungs affected by lower airway disease is increased lower airway resistance that eventually leads to air trapping or so-called dynamic hyperinflation of the lungs. The classic example of disorders that cause lower airway obstruction include feline asthma, feline or canine bronchitis, and canine bronchial collapse. In other words, these patients have lungs that are easy to inflate due to their good compliance, but hard to deflate due to their increased lower airway resistance and dynamic obstruction on expiration. Since the main problem is inability to deflate the lungs, the most helpful intervention during mechanical ventilation in these guys is an increase in expiratory time to allow them more time to deflate. Another way to combat their overinflation is to reduce their minute ventilation. Sometimes that will result in permissive hypercapnia similar to the lung injury strategy. The use of bronchodilators is important to address their underlying condition. As opposed to patients requiring the injury strategy, patients with lower airway obstruction usually do not require high PEEP. However, Significant air trapping may result in ineffective triggering that can be amended by increasing extrinsic PEEP. There are several ways how you can increase expiratory time on your ventilator. The most effective way to do so will be to decrease the frequency of breaths, which will prolong the expiratory phase and will give the patient more time to exhale. 
in some cases you cannot decrease the frequency of breaths further and you have to consider other maneuvers. In volume control mode you can increase inspiratory flow rates which will decrease duration of your inspiratory time and will automatically prolong your expiratory phase. The trade-off of doing so will be an increase in inspiratory peak pressure due to increased flow rate. In the pressure control mode, you cannot directly change the inspiratory flow rate, but you can shorten rise time, which is the time during which the vent achieves set inspiratory pressure. The shorter this time, the higher the inspiratory flow rate and the shorter the inspiratory phase, which will prolong the expiratory phase. Finally, pressure control mode will allow you to directly change the IU ratio if needed. All right, so we discussed different ways to prolong expiratory time, but how does one decide what expiratory time should be set at? There are two common ways how you can adjust the expiratory time. First method is by, by titrating E time according to the waveform analysis based on flow time scalar an intrinsic PEEP measurement. The second method is to calculate a time constant and multiply it by a factor of 3 to 5. So this is a flow time waveform. The inspiratory portion has a square form which is consistent with the constant flow rate characteristic for volume control mode of ventilation. This purple portion of the waveform represents expiration. Normally the expiratory curve goes back to the baseline prior to the beginning of the next breath indicating that the expiratory flow ceased completely. In patients with dynamic hyperinflation there is not enough time to expire and therefore the expiratory flow never reaches zero prior to the beginning of the next breath. This pattern is typical for air trapping. If you see this happening, you have to prolong the expiration phase and make sure that expiratory flow reaches the baseline prior to the beginning of the next breath. It is important to remember that normal flow time waveform does not guarantee you that there is not air trapping going on because in some cases of severe dynamic lower airway occlusion, the complete collapse of the lower airways will obstruct the expiratory flow and you won't be able to see it on the waveforms. This underdetected air trapping may be suspected in patients with increasing plateau pressures without any other reasons. Another way to detect air trapping or auto peep is to apply an expiratory hold. The vent will close its expiratory valve at the end of expiration and will measure the pressure within the airways. Patients with air trapping will have a total peep that is higher than the set peep. This difference will be equal to the intrinsic peep. In this example, the total peep is plus 10 but the set peep is only plus five. That means that there is an intrinsic or auto peep in addition to set peep of five. Another way to find the best expiratory time is to calculate a time constant. This is not something people do all the time and it is a little bit more academic, but I wanted to tell you about it in case you encountered this term somewhere. So by definition, a type constant is the length of time it takes for the lung to fill or empty. Time constant is a product of a resistance and compliance and it measured in seconds. Remember that the resistance is the pressure difference between peak pressure and plateau pressure divided by a flow rate. It is measured in centimeters of water per liter per second. Compliance is the change in volume divided by a change in pressure. 
change in volume is your tidal volume and change in pressure is either difference between peak pressure and PEEP for dynamic compliance or between plateau pressure and PEEP for static compliance. One time constant will allow to empty about 63% of the lung volume, two time constants 84% and three time constants about 95%. Therefore, the recommendation for the expiratory time is at least three times constants to make sure there's plenty of time to deflate the lungs. How can you apply this knowledge in real life scenario? Imagine you have a five kilo dog with healthy lungs who has this compliance and resistance. The time constant will be 0 0.01 times five, which equal to 0.05 seconds. If you multiply this by 3, you will get 0.15 seconds that are required for your expiration. If the dog develops ARDS, its compliance will go down, but resistance will remain the same. The time constant will be actually lower than in a healthy dog, therefore it will not need as much time for expiration. Finally, if this dog develops severe bronchitis with dynamic hyperinflation, the resistance will be significantly increased, therefore time constant will increase as well to three times higher than in a healthy dog. The expiration time in this case will need to be set at 0.5 seconds as opposed to 0.15 seconds in a healthy dog scenario. The last strategy we are going to talk briefly about is the CNS disease plus healthy lung strategy. This strategy may be required in patients with intracranial disease or diffusal or motor neuron disease. The main aspect of it in patients with an intracranial disease is avoidance of hypercapnia that will cause cerebral vascular vasodilation and further rise in intracranial pressure ICP. For the same reason, high PEEP will cause sustained increase in intrathoracic pressure and poor drainage of blood from the brain, leading to worsening intracranial hypertension. Patients with diffuse lower motor neuron disease, such as this dog envenomated by a coral snake, will tolerate hypercapnia well due to large reserves of intracranial pressure autoregulation available in animals with healthy brains, as we saw in an experimental study with rabbits. Currently, there is a trend in implementing lung protective ventilation to patients with healthy lungs as well. If by doing so the PCO2 is unacceptably high, it is recommended to increase mounted ventilation by increasing respiratory rate instead of tidal volume to avoid higher tidal volumes that may be detrimental to the lungs. It is important to remember that mechanical ventilation, if used inappropriately, may kill absolutely healthy patients. This experimental study was published in 1998 by Gronert and Haskins. They took 17 healthy dogs who were anesthetized with propofol or pentabarbital propofol combo for three weeks. They received a tidal volume of mean 15 mL per kg. All of them also received standard management that included airway management, NG tube feedings, fluids, urine drainage, enemas, and changing body positions. With this ventilation, they noted that the following complications have occurred. Pneumothorax in five dogs, pulmonary microemboli with necrosis in four dogs, tracheal perforation in one dog, sepsis in two dogs and cardiovascular failure in one dog. Eight of 17 healthy dogs died with deaths occurring on day two, five, six, eight, 10, and 18 from the start of ventilation. So in this meta-analysis, the authors uh, performed a systemic review of the scientific literature and a meta-analysis regarding the rationale of applying protective ventilatory strategies in patients at risk of ARDS in uh, the perioperative period in ICU patients.
So they concluded that implementation of protective ventilator strategies consisting of a tidal volume of 6 mL per keg and PEEP 6 to 12 centimeters of water and recruitment maneuvers can decrease the development of ARDS, pulmonary infection, and atelectasis, but there was no mortality difference.